Dr. Janine Myleaf is Executive Director of the Arts Club of Chicago, which will celebrate its centennial this year. An art historian with expertise in contemporary art and art between the world wars, Malief was formerly associate professor at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. She has published extensively in academic journals as well as international museum exhibitions. She is currently preparing a world premiere of Sharon Lockhart's new film, Rodchenko. Janine? Thank you, Netta, and thank you, Adina, for having me here, and um, for all of you for being here on a long, long day. I appreciate it. Um, and to my fellow speakers who have been really fascinating. Um, I want to warn everybody that there will be some explicit images in my talk. So this is the fun part. Um, but if you're sensitive to that, uh, just a fair warning. OK. Um, I'm going to start where Adina started um, with the ready-made and just take a look back on Duchamp's fountain, which we all probably know. Um, Duchamp claimed the ready-made as something that he wanted to be um, indifferent to. He wanted to pick an object, name it as art, and put it into an institution of art, into the art context, to kind of shift what we thought a work of art was. And so he claimed this kind of distance and um, objectivity in relationship to those objects. But the first thing that we think of when we see fountain is that it's nothing at, at all. There's nothing indifferent about it, right? It's a receptacle for bodily fluids. It's associated with the man's body. It, um, it's curvaceous. It's um, kind of dirty. And um, Duchamp didn't pick something that didn't, that didn't have meaning. He picked something that was probably very meaningful. It's been associated in the liter literature with a Madonna because of its form and also with a Buddha. So it has both masculine and, and feminized characteristics. Um, and so Man Ray, who was a close conspirator of Duchamp, um, knew very well that Duchamp's selections and namings, that process of, of picking something, wasn't at all indifferent. Um, and his direction of taking the object as a work of art made it um, very apparent, right, that it was corporealized, that it was bodily, that it, was, um, that it had associations, and that, as we've heard a lot today, um, they, were, they were very physical, right? So you have the iron um, on the right, known as Caddo, and now I will always think of it in terms of tailors um, and sweatshop <laughs> workers. Thank you, wherever you are, professor. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, of course, it has immediate physical connotations, right? You, it's, it's hot, it's ripping, um, it associates with the body. You feel kind of pain um, when you see that object. And so that idea of kind of a physical, this visceral response to an object as art is something that Man Ray um, excelled in. Okay, so I'm going to spend most of my talk today, in fact, the rest of it, um, on this one object, the object of destruction, the object to be destroyed. It was also known as perpetual mo motif, or as Edward told us, as the last object. Um, there's a version of it upstairs. Man Ray made it over and over again throughout his life, giving it these different titles. Um, he claimed that the first one was made in 1923, um, but as we'll see, its meaning really didn't take full fruition until 32, when, um, when an eye was attached to the pendulum. Um, here is the first version that I have found of it in print, which was a drawing after the object from 1932 from the journal This Quarter. And with it, there's an extensive caption, um, which I'll read to you. So Man Ray provided captions and anecdotes to control the meanings of his works of art, right? And we've heard already today about a lot of quotes of what, what he said the different works of arts did. And also, we heard about his autobiography, and I'm going to talk about both of those. But first, I'm going to read this particular, excuse me, the particular caption that came with this work. Cut out the eye from a photograph of one who has been loved but is seen no more. Attach the eye to the pendulum of a metronome and regulate the weight to suit the tempo desired. Keep going until the limit of endurance. With a hammer well aimed, try to destroy the hole at a single blow. So there's some really important things about that caption, and I want to um, stress them before I move on. First of all, the caption is a set of instructions, right? So you're being given, as the viewer, 
a set of instructions for making the work of art. So immediately, Man Ray releases this object into the public and gives it to you as the viewer to reproduce, to make on your own, to in, and to imbue it with your own meaning, your own lost love. Okay, and second of all, excuse me. Second of all, um, he gives the object agency. So you, you wind it up, and then it takes on an active role, and it ticks back and forth, and it goes tick, 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 till you can't stand it anymore, right? So, so not only does the, the viewer have agency to reproduce the work, but the object itself has agency against the maker. So you have this shifting relationship of power between the artist, the viewer, and the, maker, and the object itself. Um, so that's extremely important. So we're gonna be paying attention to this shifting of power among those three positions as I move forward. Um, Man Ray wrote, as we just heard, um, an autobiography late in his life in, in 64. Um, and this was as he, I'm sorry, I meant to set a timer and I'm gonna do that now. Okay, so, um, so he wrote this autobiography in which he tells a lot of anecdotes. And um, as we're very familiar with in our popular culture today, he told us stories that you would think he would want to suppress, but in fact, he didn't. He revealed things about himself that were not particularly flattering. For example, um, this is a picture of his first wife, Adam Lacroix. She was a Belgian poet, and uh, he married her during his period of living in Ridgefield, New Jersey, in kind of a co like a kind of utopian situation, around the same time that he met Duchamp. Um, and he talks about his relationship with her. She apparently had taken another lover. In fact, he started being with her when she was escaping a first bad situation, and she had taken another lover with him, and he was angry at her, and they were fighting. And he tells this uh, a story, um, a kind of unflattering one, where he says, she threw herself on the bed, hugging me and weeping. She loved me. Why couldn't I accept the situation? That is the situation of, it, of her cheating. I was free to live my own life as I desired it. The contact of Donna's body around my old, um, aroused my old desires, and I took her brutally. She relaxed and smiled at me through her tear-stained face. She looked radiant. So you have here a lot of confused things, right? You have her um, capitulation to his brutality, his sort of boasting of this brutality and violence against her, his being the cuckold and her asking for freedom, and this kind of strange story that, um, that he's willing to, to put out there. So in, in his autobiography, over and over again, there are stories like this. He tells of losing his virginity, in fact, and he asks, oh, was I a budding sadist or masochist? Because apparently he was not very nice to the little girl um, in which he first had <laughs> relations. And so we see this kind of setting up of a very popular, popularized idea of his own kind of pleasure in other people's pain and that very popularized idea of sadism and his own willingness to do that. Now there's a reason for this, I think, a lot of reasons maybe, but one of um, among those reasons are this kind of um, willingness to put himself into, right, a radical milieu. And a radical milieu is defined by sexuality. And even, so this is the 60s he's writing this story, but as he's writing it about the teens and 20s, and he's wanting to brand himself as a, as a radical artist. Um, and I think um, he uses, like the Surrealist Circle in general, he uses sexuality as a kind of um, badge of, of radicality. Um, sorry, before, whoops. I want to go forward. I wanted to say um, an important theoretical like, um, part of my argument is that this kind of a confession in which you make public these private stories of sexuality actually dates back to St. Augustine and Rousseau. And it was Mich Michel Foucault who told us that, obviously, that this kind of um, asking for forgiveness for our sexual misdeeds is actually, instead of really um, hiding those facts, it's putting that kind of sexual discourse into society over and over again, sort of an abundance of sexual discourse. And that kind of um, talk is, it, uh, is converting the sins into, into speech, right? And Man Ray does this. He sort of takes his actions and he puts them into the world as, as speech. And that kind of a confession sort of only sits to help kind of reiterate the, the sexuality in, in the culture. Um, so 
In his autobiography, he, says, he actually says extremely little about Lee Miller, but Lee Miller, as other testaments say, was really the love of his life. And she shows up then, not in his words, but really as a fragmented body and a t depicted over and over again in, in his works of art. Um, you saw her if you went to the show, uh, upstairs, downstairs, upstairs, right? Um, the big giant hovering lips are her lips. Um, and we see here a, a souvenir postcard of the time she spent with Man Ray. Miller herself is a photographer, if you don't know her. She went in 1929 to Paris, apprenticed herself with Man Ray. They became emotionally and professionally involved. She had something to do with the discovery on Man Ray's part, um, of their part together, excuse me, of solarization. And then she became a war photographer. And there are famous pictures of her um, in Hitler's bathtub, actually. <laughs> so she was a provocative person, to say the least. And she, she um, aligned herself with Man Ray. We see them here in a souvenir postcard that he sent her, and he wrote on the back of it, for Lee, this souvenir hoping we'll always see eye to eye. And that joke became um, prophetic, as we'll see. She, again, as uh, Lacroix started sleeping with other people, she wanted a free life. And he wanted that idea, but he just couldn't really handle it. And so they also had a very tumultuous relationship. They broke up in 32. She went back to New York, eventually um, married an Egyptian man. Um, and so he sent her this image in 32 of her eye, the eye that gets cut out and put on the metronome. And he says on the back, with an eye in reserve, material indestructible, forever being put away, taken for a ride, put on the spot, the racket must go on, I am always in reserve. So it's a kind of poem, maybe a poem of, of frustration, indestructibility of the object, the destructibility of the object, and this idea of being in reserve. So he has these, these reserve emotions held inside of this object for her, I think. And um, it was, by all accounts, a traumatic moment in his life. And he takes that moment, and here he, he makes a melodramatic kind of spoof on it, where he gives himself all the accoutrements of, of suicide and names this photograph suicide. Um, and I think it's sort of an awful photograph, actually, but it's also um, a kind of a sort of statement of his despair in a kind of spoofing way. But I think he took that, um, whoops, what happened to that? Oh, no. We're losing our battery power, guys. Um, are we not plugged in? Let's just close this. SOS. You want to see? Okay. Is that better? Oh no! Now we've. Oh well. It's back. Okay, it's back. Good. Okay. I get another minute, okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, so he, he takes those same emotions, right, and he puts them into this object in a different way. Um, and so you have, remember that, I, that original instruction to destroy the object. And we have here a thing that's like a ticking metronome that, that we have the power to destroy, but also has the power to destroy us. Just like these women in his life, you know, had this power to destroy him. Um, and he couldn't control them. And he has this idea of shifting, of shifting of power relationships, which ties in very closely to the Freudian idea of what sadomasochism was. And I bring up Freud, of course, because he was important in that circle at the time. And I won't go into a lot of the detail, but just to say that within that Freudian notion, there's this idea of the shifting of, of kind of drives from active to passive, which is exactly what's happening in this object. And it's also gendered as both feminine and masculine. So you get this positionality where there's the female is understood to be passive and the male to be active. But actually, this object kind of switches that around, right? Because the object aggresses the viewer. And so the woman ends up having this very active um, role, this active relationship. Um, there's a, a gender fudging that goes on in a lot of his works as well, even though in his macho stories he's always taking up this very masculinized position. We have works like this called La Femme, or in, uh, you can see the inscription maybe at the bottom that says La Femme, but it was published elsewhere as Man. And so he takes this everyday object again, an egg beater, and plays on its both pendulous form and also its doubling with its shadow and its maybe phallus, it's maybe breasts, it's maybe a female body. Um, there's a kind of uh, fluidity there in the identifications. 
Another um, artist in the Surrealist Circle plays on that conflation of body parts in this really great, not that well-known, um, small uh, object. What you're seeing is a mirror. Um, so it's a kind of T-shaped object in which there's a mirror in the middle. And it looks like you know, female masturbation, right? It looks like genital, female genitals with a finger in it. And the title of the work is This Movement Should Be Repeated Ten Times. <laughs> and if you swing, yes, <laughs> exactly. And there's also a movement enabled in the work where the, the mirrored panel swings itself back and forth, just like the metronome. Um, and what happens when you do that is that you reveal actually what you're seeing is not labia, but a woman's forehead with her hand and her eye being bisected by that mirror. So there's this great reveal of kind of the conflation of the eye and the, the sexuality of a woman. Um, that kind of pornographic conflation of body parts for sexual arousal was um, very common in the surrealist circles, and they looked to the um, Marquis de Sade as a, as a forerunner. Um, Georges Bataille, who was a kind of dissident surrealist, wrote his own pornographic novel where eyes turn into eggs and other kinds of forms of sexual arousal. And I don't have time to cover Bataille today, but just to say that he was part of, a, of an attempt by the surrealist circle to actually publish uh, publish and interpret the works of the Marquis de Sade. I think Man Ray's in, um, understanding of Sade was a lot more romanticized than someone like Bataille, who was very clinical about it. Um, and um, Man Ray's image, you got to see some of them in the exhibition, that he had this um, imagined portrait of Sade with his home. You had that very um, perfect um, little doll with the bondage that's up in the exhibition, which I, if I had known, I would have put a slide up in it. But um, that's from the exact time that he's writing his self-portrait again. So making these plays on his own kind of brutality, sexuality, um, interest in bondage. And um, we've already heard an interpretation of the Monument to Saad, so I won't do it again. But you remember what you heard already. God, let's hope that goes. Oh, God, sorry, guys. OK. So, but, but um, Man Ray had a closer um, collaborator than Bataille or Saad um, in the writer William Seabrook. And Seabrook was a kind of, uh, I want to say amateur, but he was an ethnographer who wrote this book, The Magic Island, about Haitian voodoo. And it was popularized as the film The White Zombie with Bela Lugosi. And um, it was about kind of voodoo charms and cannibalism, and he kind of popularized all these ideas. It's actually, if you read some of the texts, it's not as sensationalist as all the advertisements of it and interpretations of it would have been. But Seabrook himself had a very sensational persona. He was known openly among the Surrealists and his other friends um, in circles as a practicing sadomasochist. So this like um, alternative sexuality that was celebrated as a kind of um, opposition to the bourgeois culture that kind of signified this radicality and freedom that the Surrealists really um, clung on to, Seabrook practiced in his life. And he actually uh, commissioned Man Ray to help him with some of this. So um, he made some very aestheticized bondage type images with Man Ray. And you see here one of those that actually um, did make it into circulation, a kind of um, rope and nude <laughs> image. Um, but he also. Um, made some more graphic ones that did not circulate in Man Ray's day. They were, they've now are fairly well known. The one on the left is from a series of images where we have correspondence from Seabrook. I'll just go back. For those. Um, we have correspondence from Seabrook writing to Man Ray saying, let's use these kind of accoutrements, let's do this, let's do that. And in fact, they have dinner together and they invite Lee Miller. So she was part of this circle as well in that brief moment that she was together. Um, and we have these very um, strange images of Miller posing with Seabrook in this very high collar a kind of bondage image where she herself is a participant. Now in these images, she's playing that passive position taken up that Freud talks about of the feminized position and also in the more graphic images by um, Seabrook and Man Ray, that kind of position of the female. 
We know that Man Ray also helped Seabrook to produce an actual silver collar for his wife. That's um, Seabrook's wife that you see there, Marjorie Worthington, wearing this high collar that made it difficult for her. And she did actually wear that out at parties, apparently. Um, we have that in, in Man Ray's own um, kind of remembrances as well. Um, so what do we make of these strange Im images? Is Lee Miller just a kind of tool? Has she then been sort of put back into that <laughs> passive role and, and is she just a kind of toy for these men's um, erotic fantasies which are then used to kind of bolster their artistic identities? Um, in many ways we could say that yes, she has to be a, um, she has to be a willing participant in these and she is kind of self um, taking on a, a, a more um, collaborative role. And we know that because of the object of destruction. We know that uh, because of object to be destroyed. Because Man Ray <laughs> takes her eye, aligns it with the metronome, and makes it a beating force. And something that he knows that can aggress him to the point that he needs to have it destroyed. And so Lee Miller, in his life, not kind of turned into speech in his book, kind of left but as a fragmented body and a haunting image in all of his work. We know that she stayed with him, or this actually moment stayed with him, because we see how many times he reproduces the work in his um, oeuvre over and over again. And in fact, this is a very late photograph from 64, um, in which he aligns his own face with the metronome right in the center and her eye mirroring it. And we have that um, conflation now of genders put together but with himself and the other. So you have the metronome standing in as a kind of talisman for his own desires and himself and his other and his object. So we go back to where I started the talk that this object is particularly fascinating in the way it helps to kind of um, move desire and power. I'll just say one final um, idea is that in the Magic Island, Seabrook writes about love charms. And he specifically talks about one, and this is basically voodoo dolls, right? He talks, he, I can, um, he talks about taking a fragment or a piece of hair or some kind of residue from a loved one and putting it in the charm. And that's precisely what Man Ray does. And Seabrook talks about one love charm that was produced with two needles in which the eye of one and the point of the other kind of intersect and he specifically says that that will represent a woman's vulva and penetration, and that's how you get a woman to love her, as you make that object. So we have, instead of the eye of the needle or the eye of the self, we have the eye of Lee Miller and the self of Man Ray. Thank you.